Tonight we have Dr. Jerry Carzniel, who's board a certified pediatrician and a fellow in the American Academy of Pediatrics. He specializes in the recovery of neurodevelopmental chronic neuroinflammatory diseases and hormonal dysfunctions. After receiving his medical degree at St. Louis University School of Medicine, he completed his residency in pediatric medicine in the Air Force. Following Desert Storm, Dr. Kersnell practiced general pediatrics and private practice for 10 years until his fourth boy was diagnosed with autism. A nationally recognized speaker and New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Kersnell, has been in medical interventions that work to improve the lives of his patients who suffer from many types of medical conditions that include autism, allergies, inflammatory bowel diseases, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, sleep cycle disruptions, and hormonal imbalances. He regularly teaches continued medical education courses on children's health issues to physicians and other health professionals. His clinical approach is to treat the whole patient by carefully obtaining a full and complete history, and based on this history, obtaining very detailed laboratory evalu evaluations. Individualized plans are implemented, integrating the very latest medical interventions that include both traditional and complementary medicine approaches. For your pleasure, Dr. Carsnell. Well, thank you for having me uh, come up here. This is. Uh, Really exciting for me. Uh, my wife's from Sunnyvale, and uh, so coming up here is just uh, a lot of fun for us. And she didn't get to come this time. Uh, actually, most of my information comes from the adult literature, because we're not doing any investigatory work on children anymore. Uh, we're not getting any help from our, our schools about inflammation of the body, whether it be in the brain or in the gut. And I have to learn what's happening in the adult world. So. That's actually where I met Susan because I take uh, courses, what they call the anti-aging courses that you've been uh, hearing about, uh, so I could find out what are we doing in adults with uh, Alzheimer's or what are we doing with adults with Parkinson's. And a lot of that information comes down and I utilize in the children. So a lot of this is going to dovetail on what you've been hearing. Um, and if you've been touched by autism uh, with a grandchild or um, a relative or friend, uh, it's pretty devastating. And we'll go through some numbers here, but, but just for you all, what, what is autism? Uh, classically, uh, from a, a psychiatric point of view, it's a communicative disorder. They don't develop proper language skills or any language skills. They have a lot of repetitive behaviors. Uh, they have a lot of stimming kind of behavior we call stereotypy, but they kind of stim, flap, uh, lots of tantrums. Um, socially, they just can't engage with other kids or adults, and they have some very funky, abnormal toy play. That's classic definition, but from my point of view, it's a mismanagement of incoming stimuli. They don't perceive the environment, both externally or internally, in a normal fashion. Um, they, they don't see the things in front of them well with their eyes. The things that they hear can really drive them crazy. It could be a baby's cry or a siren or a vacuum, set them off. Uh, the buzzers from a haircut just causes them to just melt down. Abnormal tastes, abnormal touches, smells, but internally they have problems too. Um, they, they can't be potty trained. They don't respond to a full bladder the way you and I would, or a full rectum, or pain. My, my son could walk on hot gravel and bare feet in the middle of summer and not be bothered by it at all. Uh, so they have all these internal cues and external cues they respond abnormally to. And we've got to figure that out. It's all biochemically mediated, too. Something's going on in the brain that's not allowing it to figure out what's going on. Well, we have an epidemic now, but where did it come from? Well. In the old, old days, in 1908, it was described as Heller's syndrome, and it was one in 100,000 children back then. Um, genetic, nothing's been, really been found despite millions of dollars of research, so there isn't a such thing as a genetic epidemic. Uh, most of us here grew up, and we never saw one of these kids, ever. They didn't have classrooms full of these children. Uh, environmental, it would have to be global. I take care of children from all around the world uh, this week, from Dubai, from Australia, and Canada. They'll come in, I had one family drive from New Jersey all the way to see me in a motorhome because they couldn't, they were scared to death to put this kid on an airplane. What are the physical signs? In 1943, Leo Kanner coined the phrase autism along the same time um, that Dr. Asperger uh, coined the phrase Asperger's syndrome. I guess he could have called it Kanner syndrome, but he called it autism instead. But he noted that despite the psychiatric illness that it's considered, he said, but these kids, like in case number one, eating has always been a problem for him. He's never shown a normal appetite. 
or number two, large and ragged tonsils. In other words, this was giving me a clue as I was trying to figure this out with my own son. There are medical problems that we can deal with. Forget the autism diagnosis, but medically, what is wrong with these children? And if we fix that, can they get better? Well, it's an autism right now epidemic, but you're not hearing that on the news. You're not hearing anything about an epidemic. What is an epidemic? It's affecting or tending to affect a disproportionately large number of individuals within a population, community, region at the same time. It's huge right now. I'm going to show you a slide about that. Leo Kanner um, saw only 150 cases in his whole entire lifetime. I can see that in a couple months. Okay. Um, in Nelson's textbook of pediatrics in 1983, when I started medicine, uh, 0 0.7 to 4 cases per 10,000. Just to give you an idea, it's now 113 per 10,000. That's a lot of children being injured. A lot of children who are not going to be able to function in society. So here's the CDC's own, uh, from their own website. Uh, in 2000, they said it was 1 in 150. Same thing in, thousand, in 2002. 2004, 1 in 125. 2006, 1 in 110. 2008, 1 in 88. Okay. National Health Statistics also shows the climb. Right now, it's 1 in 62 children, but it's mostly a disease of males. So 1 in 62 children, take out the girls, they're diluting it. It's 1 in 32 males now. Wow. 1 in 32 males. When we talk about autism, we're talking about not functioning human being. Okay? We're talking about, as one mother put it, a walking kill shot. Okay? These kids are devastated. And they're, not, they're always going to need a lot of support. Now, should we do questions along the way or wait till, because I just said, what do you guys usually, if, if you could, write down your question. When you say autism... Where's your mic? Wasn't there a rule? Wasn't there a rule that you have to have a microphone? I heard that. I'm a quick learner. My wife taught me that. The, okay, the question was, does that include Asperger's? It does not include Asperger's. This is the diagnosis of autism only. Okay. So with over 4 million babies being born each year, we can expect 50,000 children to be diagnosed yearly. And if the trends keep going, it's going to become more and more. And, that, and each year, so that the burden on society to take care of these children is just going to be huge. Now, I told about, when I was political, I'm not anymore, uh, I had the opportunity to meet with the Speaker of the House, the Grand Floridian. We spent three hours together along with the, uh, the head of the Senate. And we talked about this. And they were very interested until we talked about potentially what the source of the problem was. And then they lost interest. OK. And that could be vaccines. Autism is still classified as a psychiatric disorder. Comes under the heading of childhood psychosis. Treatment is geared toward managing mental illness and does not take into account or even address the medical problems. And that's why they're not doing a very good job in that department. So the best kept secret is I don't treat autism, but I treat the underlying medical problems. And that's why I have to keep searching the medical literature what I can do for like, for example, these kids have lots of gut issues. They have constipation or they have diarrhea or they have both. That's telling me that there's something going wrong in the gut and I better fix that. Um, sleep issues. Some of these kids um, will be up for three days straight and then they'll sleep for 10 hours up for three days. Some of the kids will sleep 20 minutes up for three hours, 20 minutes up for three hours. The number one torture in the world is still what? Sleep deprivation. These parents are being tortured by their children. Um, I had one dad, he hadn't slept for five years, a man of great means. He said to me, Dr. Carson, if you can get my kid to sleep all night, I will buy you a Porsche Boxster. Okay. I got the kid to sleep through the night, no problem, but I'm still waiting for my midnight blue Porsche Boxster. I think he forgot he was sleep deprived, yeah. Neurologic issues, um, psychiatric issues, of course, and we'll talk about some of these endocrine issues. I'm not going to go too much in depth because I was kind of warned about this group. I didn't, you know, for my families or physicians, I go real in depth. But for you, I'm just going to kind of paint a broad picture of what we're doing here and how you might be able to be, use that information maybe for your own issues. What do I see biologically different in these kids? Well, they've got inflammatory bowel disease. They've got mucus in their stools. They've got blood in their stools. They've got um, a lot of what we call inflammatory markers. They reflux a lot. Okay, and that burns the, uh, the swallowing pipe we call the esophagus. Um, can you imagine trying to put a kid to sleep when he's refluxing and you don't treat the reflux? It's just not going to work. Their, um, their, their stomach is inflamed. We call it gastritis. They've got abnormal things growing in their bowels. 
They've got leaky gut. They're, they're like leaking whole proteins and foods into their bloodstream, which the immune system hates. Or they can't absorb any food. It's just being passed. Immunologically, I have kids who have lots and lots of ear infections, 20, 30, 40 different ear infections. They get tubes, they get ear infections, sinus infections, but not once does the pediatrician think about doing an immune system workup. As if they had, not really, but if they had AIDS, they'd get an immune workup. Well, this kid keeps getting sick, maybe we should do an immune system workup and see what's not working, instead of just giving another antibiotic, another antibiotic, causing all kinds of stuff to happen in the bowels. Food allergies. I had to put that in for you. Uh, recurring illnesses, autoimmune disease, inflammation, neurologically. 30% of my, my children with autism have epilepsy, okay? Uh, low muscle tone. They have perfusion defects through the brain. The brain's not getting enough oxygen. And we can see that in what's called a spec scan. And, and the list goes on. I'm not going to name them all, but you can see I got endocrine disorders. So as a, as a doctor, I got lots to do. And as I nail each one of these things and fix it, whatever they have for autism gets better and better and better. Now they start sleeping through the night. Now they're able to be taught. You know, if you think about these kids, they got this brain that's called a hard drive, you know, kind of like a computer system. And all these therapists, whether it be speech therapists or physical therapists, those are my software loaders. They try to load the software in. But if the hard drive isn't working, good luck with that. So what I try and do is get that hard drive working so I can make these therapists look like rock stars. So what do we see usually in the clinic? Parents come in and say, hey, look, the poop smells foul. It's yellow. It's green. They've got these big bloated bellies. They're not speaking, they're not sleeping. Um, you can't do errands with them. They tantrum when you put them in the car seat. You know, they do the full stretch and try and bend that, you know, into a car seat and put, okay, they just, they cover their ears, they make lots of sounds, they tantrum severely, they can have fevers, they won't potty train, and on it goes. What I see in my office, poor eye contact, nonstop moving, they tend to be pretty hyperactive, but I can have the couch potato too, the one who just doesn't move. They have language problems, of course. Um, they don't play well with toys. If they're interested in the Brio trains, they'll just roll it back and forth and look at the wheels, look back and forth, look at the wheels. Um, restricted diet, they love bread, gluten, wheat, okay? We're really bad for these kids. Cheese, juice, milk, chips. And they'll graze in the office, they'll keep eating, they'll just keep feeding them, you know, Doritos and stuff like that. Full of MSG. Okay. Dark circles below the eyes, dry pale skin, draw, draw, dull hair, straw-like white tongue, dilated pupils, they're a mess. They're a mess, and they're miserable. So I thought, well, for you guys, let's just say genetics. Let's look at one thing. There's a lot of things, but I thought, let's look at one thing. And it's called the methylation pathway, and it makes glutathione. I have it there in big, bold letters. Where'd my pointer go? Can you take my pointer? Oh, all right. Anyway, um, glutathione. And glutathione is the kind of like a garbage truck that goes around our body and picks up stuff. And if you don't have enough garbage trucks, these toxic things accumulate. Um, and you can be genetically programmed to be a poor methylator. In other words, mom and dad did not give you the right genes to make enough garbage trucks to detoxify your body. And the family history will let me know. So if there's a family history of alcoholism, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, depression, thank you. Okay. Uh, attention deficit disorder, autism, constipation, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, thyroid dysfunction. If I have any of that, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, if I have that in the family, then I know that they're not making enough glutathione. So if they're not making enough glutathione, you'd say, well, how do we help these kids make glutathione? That would be a good thing to do. Uh, we can do a, a genetic testing, and you can see here the result positive for one copy of the C677T mutation and one copy of the A1298C mutation. So I know right then from a blood test, genetic test, that this kid, along with the family history, probably got into trouble because you couldn't detoxify the garbage, maybe starting in utero, okay, that was being processed to the baby. Uh, we can look at glutathione, and I'll just kind of highlight the one area I'm thinking about. GSH stands for glutathione. In the controlled children, it's 7.6. In autistic children, it's almost half that. So um, that's from uh, Dr. Jill James. And that tells me, again, I have genetics that say the child shouldn't be able to make glutathione. I got the family history saying the child shouldn't make glutathione. And I got studies that tell me that these children don't make glutathione. So this is what we do. We give them um, methyl B12, and we give it usually as an injection. Anybody get B12 shots? Here's one. OK. Is it awesome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. What's awesome about it? It just gives, for, for you guys, it's going to give you a lot more energy, a lot more focus. Okay. Hey, we give it every other day. Sometimes every day. 
Um, I also give it along with trimethylglycine or dimethylglycine, folic acid, leucovorin, and I can even give glutathione transdermally. I can give it oral too. And this is kind of the area in the brain. This is what we know about all the mechanics of the cell, and that's the glutathione pathway right there. That's a schematic drawing. We'll talk about this later, because you're going to keep stopping me. All right, what about allergies? Allergies, IgE tells you how allergic you are to the world. This is what's responsible for giving you the sneezing, the coughing, the itchy, hives, and maybe anaphylactic shock like to peanuts or, or to fire ants. Um, normal in this lab was 0.5 to 393. Usually in children, it's somewhere around 20. This child had 2,500. So this child's going to be allergic to the world. Okay? Now, shouldn't this child be on at least some Claritin or Singulair or something like that? Yeah. Maybe some Benadryl for sleep. Maybe doing things that decrease the allergy load in the room, like ripping out the carpet. Okay? And uh, maybe getting rid of cats and dogs. Okay? This, these are children who are suffering. This, this is not normal. My clinic high, by the way, is 7,000. And these are kids who come in and their, their skin's peeling off like a, you know, a reptile molting. So what do they look like? Well, they tend to have allergic shiners. Those are the dark circles under the eyes. Okay? Eczema and asthma, fungal skin infections, oral thrush, you know, like what babies get, that white plaque in their mouth. Um, a viral infection of the skin called molluscum contagiosum and warts, another viral infection. They scratch a lot. They'll tell you their lungs feel itchy if they can talk. They just feel itchy inside. Um, and I can look at autoimmunity markers, increased IgE, uh, killer cell functions. I can do the workup and find out why our kids aren't doing well. And treat it. And it's going to make them feel better. OK, let's move to the gut. The gut, the gastrointestinal, if you strip the gut's ability to keep foreign things inside the gut, travels in your mouth, down, Whatever your body doesn't want to absorb gets pushed out through your bottom. If that's the stuff that shouldn't be getting in your body gets in your body, it's bad news. And we call that leaky butt, leaky gut. <laughs> leaky butt, too, if you've got diarrhea. And it's going to cause a whole lot of things that shouldn't be growing in your bowels to grow, like clostridia, parasites, okay, uh, strep organisms, cause a lot of inflammation and mucus production. And of course, they can't absorb foods that they should. And all of a sudden, they can't absorb any of the um, vitamins. So I can get some ideas that something's going on with the child, a poor breastfeeder, persistent colic. Remember colic? You know, three or four hours, fussy baby, maybe from three weeks of life to about eight weeks of life. You know, my son, my first boy, started at 6 o'clock, ended at 10.04. You can set your clock by it, OK? He's just going to be a little fuss buster. He can kind of walk him around, OK? That's colic. Colic has now morphed into a term to being a fussy baby 24 hours a day. Oh, your baby's just colicky. That's not colic. Colic is a self-limited disease, three to four weeks, a certain period of the day, and it's over with. These kids can be colic when they're two. Um, they have a lot of eczema. They have sensitivities to foods, failure to thrive. They're not growing well. So what I'm showing you is that autism has a lot of medical issues that we can take a, take a, you know, a look at and treat. So these are the things that we see in our kids. Lots and lots of stuff to take care of. Now, if there, I always throw in a few studies for everybody. Um, undigested food in the stool. Well, we've known about this since like 1999. This was one of the first studies uh, by Dr. Corolla Horvath, who said that when he looked at 36 children, they had reflux. They had chronic inflammation at the end of the stomach called the duodenum, duodenitis. Ice just means inflammation like tonsillitis, appendicitis. If you see a word with itis, it means it's inflamed. Um, and they have um, low digestive enzymes. So some of these kids really respond to digestive enzymes. Okay, But we know this. This is gastrointestinal abnormalities in children. It says 1999. But how many of these kids go to the pediatrician and get treated appropriately? They don't. Oh, he's just screaming because he's autistic. Maybe he's in pain. Maybe something hurts, one of those itises. Okay. Constipation, again, this was done, what, in 2003? Constipation with acquired mega rectum. Mega means big. Rectum, I mean, this, this, these kids come in and they are so FOS, full of stool, okay? FOS, full of stool. And um, they, can, they can probably have about five pounds of stool in there. And you've got, you've got organic material, you know, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, sitting at 98.6 degrees body temperature in a black, wet environment. 
What's not going to grow in there? Okay, that's why it can smell pretty horrific. Um, this is an x-ray report, typical x-ray report. The, col the colon is filled with feces, compatible with constipation. Filled with feces. All right, so this is the kind of, uh, this is the most elegant picture for you guys I can come up with. I didn't want to gross you guys out. Uh, that's not normal. It almost looks like it came from Dairy Queen. Uh, poor, poor absorption. This could be a problem with fructose, which is fruit sugar, milk, which is a big problem for our kids. And there's that word gluten from wheat. They can have snaky stools, they can have pebbly stools, they can have different color, they can have yellow, red, green, black, white stools. That's all a clue. You know why pediatricians used to wear bow ties in the old days? Because they'd examine the stool and they wouldn't want their tie to get into the diaper. Okay? We, you know, the be when you get behind a car and it's chugging out black smoke, you don't have to be a rocket science to figure out there's something wrong with that engine. Okay? When you see something coming out of these kids' heinies and it's really awful, you don't have to be a rocket science to figure out there's something wrong with his metabolic engine, okay? But we're not looking at that anymore. When I improve the bowels, well, the poop gets better, the sleep improves, eye contact improves, they start talking, tantrums improve, appetite improves, they just seem happier in the skin they're in, and I look like a rock star, but what did I do? Nothing hard. I just fixed the poop problem, just like I would with any of you guys. If you've ever been constipated, you know you're not on your A game. And if you have some diarrhea, you're not on your A game. That's the same with these kids, too. We could take x-rays. And abnormal bowels will, will present with constipation, diarrhea, not eating, waking up at night, reflux, foul-smelling breath, foul-smelling stools. And we have the ability to get an x-ray. And you can see, this is kind of hard back for you guys to see, but this whole area is just full of poop. Um, when it's dense, it's white like bone. And you can see this area right along here. It's surrounded by a little bit of air. That's the bowel wall. That's just full of stool, just giant logs in these kids. You can feel it if they'll let you. Sometimes these kids do not want to have any part with a physical exam. So there's some laboratory work I can do. I can look at urine organic acids and opiates and peptides. You know, these kids will turn, turn gluten, there's that word again, gluten, like wheat products and dairy into narcotics, to opiates. And we have them pee in a cup, just like they do at Home Depot. You know, they say all of our employees are drug tested. I can send these children's urine off the lab and it'll come back positive for for narcotics, for opiates. Well, we know they're not doing drugs. What, they'll, they'll fractionate it from me with something called a mass spectrometer and say, this narcotic is due to um, or derived from gluten or dairy or both. Now, when you, when you take a bottle of cough medicine that's got what we used to call GI gin, uh, that's got a narcotic in there, uh, it'll say on there maybe habit forming, maybe drowsy, maybe constipating, okay? So sometimes when I put, take this out of their diet, that constipated stool goes away because I've just removed their narcotic. But they're addicted to that narcotic. What do you think they're like when we take away their gluten and their dairy? It's an ugly two weeks. Sometimes I have to give the kids Valium. Sometimes I have to give mom the Valium. But we can go from sand in a diaper to normal poo in a toilet, which means we're getting potty trained. That was a Christmas card I got. OK. I got lots of cool stuff. All right, diarrhea, the other end of the spectrum, one to six stools a day. Some can be explosive. Of course, it's foul, varied in colors. Often results in a burning diaper rash and can be very difficult to clean up. It's painful for the child to express. It's painful for the child to have against their hiney. It's painful for the child to be wiped. So they learn a lot of aversion techniques, man. They don't want you touching anything down there. Everything hurts them. Management of diarrhea, well, I change their diet. I remove gluten and dairy to start, and then I remove fruit and fruit juices. But those are so healthy. Not necessarily for these kids. It might not be healthy for these kids. And they drink lots and lots and lots of juice because our diets have changed. When I grew up, juice was a rare treat. Mom, when we had a little extra money, would bring home Welsh's grape juice. And that was so good. The rest of the time, we were drinking water from the sprinklers of the garden hose. BPA free garden hoses for you guys, OK? <laughs> um, we may have to put these kids on antibiotics because they have overgrowth of bacteria that needs to be swatted, or antifungals, maybe some antiparasitics. Um, adding zinc, adding fiber, very important. A lot of these kids don't eat any vegetables. So this is what it looks like. This is what I call the Preger belly look. This pediatrician says, I don't treat constipation in children under two. And you can tell from the pubic bone to the belly button, that's what I call the Preger belly look. And look what it's doing to his spine. And what do you think that does to his gait and his balance, his center of gravity? It's all screwed up. How can you send him off to any kind of training program looking like that? It, it, it's just miserable. It's just very painful. 
And like I said, this is normal. You get, well, actually, you can see a lot of stool in here, over here. Look at all this, what we call ground glass, all this sh schmutz. That's all. Look at this area here. Just, it's got to be the size of a grapefruit. Okay, that's how dilated it gets. This is what a normal one looks like. Remember, everything dense is white, so you can see a lot of just non-dense material in there. Pretty cool. And here's another. This one I use, well, you can't see it in here, so never mind. But this one really shows the bow walls nicely, but you can't see it. So, Anyway, we fix, the, we fix the constipation. The kids feel dramatically better. Here are the treatments I use for constipation. Um, some things we have to use on natural. I mean, I love to use natural stuff, but sometimes we just have to get in there with, with Miralax, uh, with fiber, high-dose vitamin C, magnesium, magnesium citrate. Um, we've even had to um, get them into the um, x-ray suite and with an enema, fill them up with this contrast material and have it move out because either that or I have to admit them, put a tube down their nose and fill them up with Go Lightly. Who's had the pleasure of doing Go Lightly? Can you imagine doing that with an autistic four-year-old? Okay. First, I can drink a gallon. Fiber is so important for these kids. Um, it's important for all of us. We all should be taking fiber. Dysbiosis, bad bugs behaving badly in the bowels. These are just things that shouldn't be there. Usually they overgrow after repeated antibiotics. And uh, as we get older, we get put on antibiotics. Oh, you got a sinus infection. Oh, you've got a little lung infection. How about a little bit of Levoquin? That'll just mess up your bowels real good. And we don't talk about probiotics. So when the doctor says, okay, you do need this antibiotic, okay, you maybe really do need this antibiotic, but they don't say, in one hand, here's your Zithromax. On the other hand, here's your probiotic. You'd do well to take the probiotic for a couple, three months, maybe for the rest of your life after being on the antibiotic. But you don't hear that. But you guys probably have heard that. Okay, and it's very important. And we've got to watch out because everybody says, oh, our probiotic is best and the rest are dirt, you know. But, but you've got to get something going there. So I can do some studies to see what's growing in there. I can do fungal cultures and parasites and stuff like that and then treat appropriately. And we can see them. Um, this one, this child had uh, lots of what they call dientamoeba fragilis and trophozoites and I see endolemix nana and hookworm and roundworm and all kinds of stuff you just wouldn't expect in a child. But if you don't look, you're not going to find. And if you find it, you can treat it and you can make it better. These things can migrate in all of us. And it can cause autoimmune disease, too. Uh, here's a study where this child had H. pylori, which will give a lot of stomach upset, a little bit of yeast, and uh, trichomonas. Trichomonas in a child? Are you kidding me? OK, they get some really funky stuff you have to treat. Yeast, we call this in medical school the spaghetti and meatball sign. You can use your imagination and see why we call this spaghetti and meatballs. But that's what it looks like. And again, you can grow it on a scale of 0 to 4. Candida albicans is 4. But this child also had Pseudomonas aeruginosa growing in the bowels. That means the bowels are not moving, I can tell you. And I can't fix nothing if you don't move your bowels because it's just going to grow back, whatever it is. If you've got this decaying, rotting material in the bowels, I can't fix that. And we know that, again, as our adults. Good. Um, that's why they talk about enemas and cleaning out the bowels. Cleaning out the bowels, so important for us. These treatments, I use antifungals. I don't mess around. Then I can use some natural stuff, but natural things taste yucky, and these kids are not swallowing capsules yet. So the oregano that you hear people taking for you know, bowel infections or garlic or whatever, those are all great. But open up a capsule of oregano and, and have a kid take some of that. Good luck with that. They just won't. Um, we have to check liver functions if we're on this. We may raise the, the pH with uh, some bicarbonate, but make sure that they're pooping every day. And then here are the natural things, if you can swallow pills. So if you do have yeast, treat, treat yeast issues, these are like really great treatments. Monolaurin, um, that actually is derived from our friend the coconut. Okay, so, um, so monolaurin is actually a, um, it basically scrubs the coats right off of these bacteria and kills them. It's pretty good. Oregano, nothing grows in a petri dish on oregano. You can't, you can't grow anything. So oregano is good for killing stuff. Olive leaf extract, caprylic acid, berberine, garlic, probably a lot of things that you guys have heard about through all these talks about bowel health that you've probably gotten. I hope you haven't. You need to get some. Antibiotics I use. We don't need to go over that. All right, inflammatory bowel disease. Sometimes we have to get these kids scoped. 
I keep uh, a few GI doctors very busy. They do endoscopy. They put the child to sleep. They put a scope down the throat. They just look and see what's going on from the, from the mouth to the esophagus, the swallowing pipe, to the, the stomach, to the duodenum. Then they pull it out and they shove it up the hiney and they come up and over. We clean them out because they just run into a roadblock with a lot of these kids and see if there's inflammatory bowel disease. And then we have to treat what we find. This is my son. Um, I'm very proud of him. Made the big screen here. He had lots of little ulcers. Again, you can't see too well with the lighting in here, but uh, we had him take a pill cam. You can actually swallow a camera now for these children, as well as adults. And you know, I just told you this, the, when you do endoscopy, you can go down the throat into the stomach, and then you got to stop. That's as far as the scope will go. You pull it out, and then you can advance the hiney, and you go up the left side, right, and down, and then you got to stop. But everything else, all those small intestines, you've never been able to see. But now you can swallow a camera, and as it tumbles, it takes pictures all the way through. And for the first time in a living human being, not a cadaver, you can see they've got ulcers all the way through their stomach. Ever have an, an ulcer in your mouth? A little aptus ulcer or something like that? Fever blister? Can you imagine a kid with a thousand of these things in his stomach? Of course they're going to be miserable. That's not autism. That's infection. Fix it, and you've got a better kid. So you can kind of see on this picture here, oops, uh, this pale halo around this owie. That's a crater. That's an ulceration. And anytime something brushes against it, it stings. And we can fix that if you look. If you don't treat it, you got an autistic kid. They can be virus. They can have. They can have a viral component. We might have to give them IV immunoglobulin. Curcumin. I use a lot of curcumin in my practice. You guys know what curcumin is? It's a anti-inflammatory from turmeric. And uh, I learned that from two, two places. Long Vita is a patented product from UCLA that they found actually decreases inflammation. They're looking for neuroinflammation. It was uh, concocted at their Alzheimer's and Parkinson's clinic. And uh, so I said, well, if it's an anti-inflammatory for the brain, I wonder if we could use it for the bowels. Uh, Omega-3s, you guys are probably hearing a lot about omega-3s, one of nature's best anti-inflammatories. And uh, sometimes I'll use Motrin, OK? It, it's also inflammatory, but it's mostly an anti-inflammatory. And L-glutamine. Reflux, a lot of uh, ear infections are due to reflux. Sinus infections are due to reflux. Asthma attacks are due to reflux. So instead of just keeping treating the ear infection, the asthma, sinus infection, why don't we treat the reflux so make all that other stuff go away? It just makes sense to go after the source of the problem. This is what a normal esophagus looks like, this nice smooth tissue, and that's the swallowing hole there. And here you can see where it's eroding. This is what we call a cobblestone look. All right, so what do we do? Uh, we, we remove the exogenous allergens. These are foods, and I have to do some extensive testing to find out what foods. You know, the body, when, it, when you feel reflux, you guys have all reflux. You eat a meal, and it's like you reflux the onion or the bell pepper or something. That's your body saying, that one ingredient I don't like. Okay, that's your poor man's test to find out that's not sitting well. Tastes great, but it's not sitting well in my stomach. So the stomach tries to evacuate what it doesn't like, and that's the reflux. So a child who refluxes a lot, it might be dairy, especially in that first year of life. This kid spits up all the time, spits up all the time. He's telling us the cow milk is not doing well for me. And I have to put him on the same stuff you guys take, Zantac, Prevacid, you know, Nexium, a little purple pill, okay? We can do the dietary sensitivity. This is just a, a, a massive list of foods that these kids can be uh, allergic to. And it gives me a starting point on what to take out of the child's diet. And you should hear the moms, no, we can't remove gluten and dairy. That's, he loves that. OK. So oh, remove gluten and dairy. So the poor man's thing, just remove it. I don't need to do a test. Just 80% of my kids respond well. And 80% of my parents who go on the gluten-free, dairy-free diet with their child, they tell me, oh my gosh, I'm feeling so much better and I'm losing weight. Because gluten, like anything that comes from the, the, the flour products that you eat, gluten is the, um, the glue in, that holds things together. So a pizza is made of gluten-enriched flour. And that's why they could toss it up in the air and it looks like rubber. Uh, when my mom wallpapered the house, what did she use? Flour and water. Made a paste. Okay. Our bodies can't break that down. They've changed the gluten. 
as he was saying earlier, they changed the gluten on us, the wheat. When I was a kid growing up, the wheat used to grow six feet tall, and it would hang over at the top, and you'd get one crop a season. Now it grows three feet tall, and you get three crops a season, and it stays straight up. And it's pesticide resistant, so you can spray your weed be gone right on it, okay? So you don't have to separate the weeds from that. It went from 14 chromosomes to 28 chromosomes. That's what they call genetically modified. Our body doesn't know what to do with it. And that's why all of a sudden, everybody's allergic to gluten. All these restaurants have gluten-free menus. What happened? We didn't have gluten-free menus when I was a kid, and you didn't have gluten-free menus when you guys were kids. You ate a hamburger bun, you ate a hamburger bun. They changed the food source on us, and it's in everything. So you gotta be careful with that. And when you're not eating gluten, you're going to lose the weight. And another good book uh, is called Wheat Belly. Okay, to complement his book, Wheat Belly. And uh, you will lose your wheat belly. Okay, and beer is made from wheat, too. So you have to go up beer. All right. Um, these kids are very addicted to these foods because remember they make the morphine and when you remove a drug from an addict they go nuts. So you got to be careful with that. Diets, there are many different diets. The best diet is the one that works for you or your child. Uh, laboratory investigations can help us. Trial and error may be the only way to find out. I have kids who go absolutely stark raving crazy after they eat dark pigmented fruits like blackberries, blueberries. Okay, That tells me they're having an issue with something in there, or they have different foods that they can go crazy with, oxalates. So there's a lot of things besides just gluten and dairy that can drive our kids crazy. And uh, we need to go organic. We need to cook like grandma did. All right, you guys remember this, apple pie. My grandma made the best apple pies just emerging from World War II. She'd make the greatest pie crust in the world, slice up a bazillion apples, and then she'd go in and reach just for a pinch of sugar, because if you remember, sugar was rationed back in those days. So she was used to that. A pinch of sugar, and then a little bit of cinnamon, and that was her apple pie, and it was magnificent. Now if you order apple pie, it's full of this what? This glazy snot. Okay, that's a ton of sugar. So we are just increasing the amount of sugar we're consuming. You have to go back the way the grandparents, you guys had it right, okay? Um, and you have to shop on the outside of the aisles. I always tell that. Meats, fruits, vegetables. You're not getting all the packaged goods. You walk into a Walmart, half the Walmart store is what? Those frozen food cases. It's really bad. And there's some interesting statistics on how many people now consume prepared meals or eat out each week. I won't bore you with the statistics, but it's, it's incredible. All right, this was before autism hit my life. This is one of my first victims. His name is John, he's eight years old. You can see he's wearing his Little League shirt, but he had this real problem. He'd go from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, like that, and become evil. His eyes would roll up in his head. And these parents were great parents, man. They read all the books, the dare to discipline, the strong-willed child, and all that kind of stuff. Nothing worked, man, when he flipped, you can't really see, but his face is red. He's tearing his room apart. He's pulling this mattress off. And you know, Dad says, if you can hold yourself together, you can have horseback riding license. If you fall apart, you're not going to play in tonight's Little League game. He went to go see the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist said he had a severe mood and thought disorder and needed to put him on lithium. I said, well, I might put your kid on lithium, but I'm not going to put my son. This is John, my second boy. And uh, I noticed that one morning after I made him waffles and pancakes and syrup, he went nuts. And I said, you know, I wonder if this is sugar. So I removed all sugar from his diet and we never saw his behavior again. So I think back then God was teaching me a lesson that foods can't alter behaviors. And now look where we have all these ADD kids taking Ritalin, but they're also drinking these giant sodas and eating tons of processed food and all that food is converted to sugar. French fries are converted to sugar. My, my fourth boy is a diabetic. I know sugar and I have to give him insulin. And french fries are just like a soda, this kid. Okay. Oh, eicosanoids is an inflammatory mediator, the sugar link to mood and mad behavior. You mean they've done studies on this? But I thought the American Academy of Pediatrics 10 years ago said it was false to consider that sugar affects mood. Well, ask any teacher around Easter or Halloween if that's true. Okay. All right, so we have to supplement these kids. Why do we do that? We try to improve the function of the immune system, enhance cognitive abilities, improve red cell membrane function. A lot of doctor stuff I try and do. Because if these kids are just eating, as my son was, my fourth boy, um, chips ahoy, cookies, bacon, fruit loops, french fries, and because I'm a pediatrician, ate Flintstones vitamin, he was not going to do well with that. So we had to figure out how to supplement these children. 
and I usually use vitamins and minerals to, to replenish what they're not consuming. Remember, medicine got its, its start like with, with vitamin deficiencies. Vitamin C deficiency is scurvy. Okay, that's why we call the Brits limeys because they realized that if they took limes on their long voyages, the guys wouldn't lose their teeth and their muscle strength. Okay, scurvy. Digestive enzymes, omega-3 fatty acids, and fiber, just like what we've been talking about. All right, I always bring this in. What would you feed a million dollar racehorse? These people take care of these horses. They get the best food ever. I have the hardest time convincing families, and I had one yesterday who I just about fired, not to feed junk. Why would you feed a racehorse one way and your kid? Isn't your kid more worth than a racehorse? But they feed these kids junk. I tell them, remove the sugar. All sources must be greatly minimized. Juices, cereals, soda, bakery items. The body doesn't care what its sugar source is. If it's organic honey from California, organic maple syrup from Canada, sugar is sugar to the body. Markedly decrease the carbohydrates, the chips, MSG, fries, breads, pastas, remove all food colorings and dyes, remove sources of fast food, frozen food, snack food, what are they going to eat? <laughs> you know? um, consider removing dairy and gluten. So where does that leave you? Meats, eggs, fruits, vegetables, and water. Pretty basic, but man can survive on that, and so can women. I like nuts and seeds, but these kids don't do that very well, and they can choke on them. Like nut butters. Oh, nut butters I like, sort of. Jess, what about nuts and seeds and nut butters? Um, when they're in a highly allergic state, the nuts are very pro-allergic, okay? Not too many people wear a medic alert bracelet saying I'm allergic to lettuce, but to nuts, you betcha, and peanuts. So I try and say, seeds are great, but, and I, and I had one yes, what, two days ago, was eating uh, sunflower seed butter, and, and that works good. All right. So that's our general supplements. Sleep, oh, this is the greatest thing for my father-in-law, melatonin. If you have problems sleeping, try melatonin, okay? Um, we know in autism it's a problem. This was published in 1990, a novel biochemical model linking dysfunctions in brain melatonin, blah, 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 and serotonin and autism. So I knew that, and so with these kids who are not sleeping, I think of this article and say, well, why don't we try some melatonin? Of course, it's not going to work if your bowels are impacted with stool. We've I mean, got to get some basics done. If you're being driven crazy with gluten, dairy, and sugar, we've got to take care of that too. But once you get all that under the control and the child's still not sleeping, melatonin is fantastic. I give my father-in-law three milligrams of slow-release melatonin, and he just does great. And by the way, again, I applied these same principles to him 12 years ago when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Totally reversed it. But I chelated him, I put him on the oils, I changed his diet, okay? And he's still living on his own, driving, does everything great. The team that was following has never seen that before, okay? So if you catch this stuff early, you can make some incredible changes, okay? And I know that's what you guys are into. But I'm a pediatrician. I do not have an Alzheimer's clinic, thank you. Melatonin, 5-HTP, these are things that apply to um, us at any age. Vitamin D, GABA, cortisol replacement. We'll talk about that at the end of the talk here. Sleep, I, if I have to use chemicals, Benadryl, because they are very allergic, ibuprofen. And then if I have to come in with the big guns and retrain the brain to sleep, sometimes these children's brains do not know what a sleep cycle is. They've just never trained. And all God's creatures sleep. And these kids won't. They defy it. Then I might have to use clonidine, trazodone, Risperdal, Buspar, evil stuff from the pharmaceutical industry. But you know what? It works. And if it keeps the parent from killing the kid or the kid from killing the parent, it's a good thing. I do it for 60, 90 days, get the brain, tr get the brain used to sleeping every night, get the ritual, the, the habit formed, then I can back them off of that stuff. And I do. I don't leave them on this. Inflammation, you have to treat inflammation. Anytime you have inflammation anywhere in the body, the brain is going to know it and the brain is going to cycle down and get stupid. You know, when you've got a cold, that's not the day you want to go and take a calculus test, okay? If you've got something going on, you just want to be left alone, and if you're a guy, you do get left alone, you just go to your room and the wife shuts you in the room and gives you Motrin and says, be quiet. Don't come out till you feel better. Um, women, of course, they work through the day like there's nothing going on. But the brain gets stupid when there's inflammation in the body. And that's why everybody keeps talking about neuroinflammation, chronic inflammation, you've got to get it under control, or you're going to be sick all the time. 
So in my, my practice, I have to look for reflux because that's inflammation. Remember that itis is inflammation, esophagitis, or gastritis, or duodenitis, or colonitis, or gastroenteritis. So I have to look at all that stuff. But some of these kids can have um, chronic viral activation. I do have kids with Lyme's disease in my practice. They got it from mom, believe it or not. Uh, Low-grade bacterial infections, and then I can look in the laboratory to find stuff. For allergies, I can use some traditional things like Claritin, Zyrtec, Singular, and Azonex, Gastrochrome, Quercetin, and then we might have to do some kind of uh, desensitization programs for the allergies. For the antacids, I don't have anything better than Nexium, Prilosec, Pepsid, Tagamet, whatever the, the uh, insurance company will tell me I can use. And then if there's gut, gut inflammation, then I have to use real drugs to get, at least get it under control, and then I can back off on that. If there's inflammation due to infections, well, I gotta treat the infections. Okay, um, and anti-inflammatories, I hate to use them, but sometimes I need to get things under control. I love the natural stuff. The curcumin, omega oils, and pycnogenols, we can use a lot of them in our clinic. They're great, but they're not 100%. And that's where, where I have a little problem, because you talk to the natural people, and they say, oh, we can deal with anything with these things. Not my kids, okay? They don't, my kids don't respond to placebo effect. What you see is what you get. Spec scans. Um, this is something that you guys have probably seen a little bit of. Uh, we, we know what a normal blood flow through the brain looks like. This is a, uh, a kind of a graphic representation of a normal brain, computer generated based on what it's seeing going on in the brain from a radioactive nuclear tracer that we inject into the child. So we inject a radioactive nuclear tracer into the child. It fills the brain up where the blood flow is going. It doesn't go where the blood flow is not going. So we can actually figure out what we need to treat. So again, for ADD, this is normal, but you can see the holes here. <laughs> That's the bad brain, okay? So you don't want that brain, you want that brain. So we can kind of see, and that can help me figure out why I can't get focus and concentration out of a child. And this is the area that does it all, right here in the front. We got a big one, okay? Most of us do, I should say. Okay, um, the prefrontal cortex of the brain controls the focus. This is the underside of the brain. This is like, like the nose is up here and you're like looking up through the neck and you're, and you're looking at the bottom of the brain there. And uh, this controls focus, forethought, impulse control, judgment, organization, planning, empathy, and insight, which our kids have a real problem with. And you can see the bad brain. Short attention span, weak working memory, poor impulse control, disorganization, poor judgment, and problems with long-term controls. That's telling me there's not, Remember, this is a graphic representation. There's not really a hole there. That's just below the threshold of the die that the computer wants to read. So it shows you a kind of a picture that area is not getting enough um, blood flow. I can improve that, okay? That's the nice thing about this. The cingulate gyrus, the gear shifter, cognitive and behavioral flexibility shifts attention from one thing. These kids get hyper-focused on stuff, okay? And they'll just keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. Anterior singular problems, they're inflexible, they hold grudges, they have obsessive thoughts, they worry, they're oppositional, they're argumentative, and they're susceptible to addiction and basal ganglia functions. And we can go through each of these. But I'm just showing you that we can look in the brain and get an idea of what's going on in there after we fixed everything from the neck down. All right. Boring, boring, boring. Temporal lobe functions, uh, those are very important for our kids. Uh, they don't lay down memory. Uh, they can't control their emotions. They can't process uh, multi-sensory. Everything drives them nuts, and they're not learning. So this is an area that I'm particularly interested in getting our kids working on. So we know a lot, a lot about the brain. The problem is, can we fix it? Um, language problems, memory problems in this temporal lobe, aggressive, and um, they feel things in their body. All right, let's move on. I just thought this was kind of cool for you guys to see. There are six types of ADD patterns that we've noticed with this. Well, let me put it this way. If, if I had a gentleman who was 400 pounds and wanted to lose weight, there's a lot of diets I could put him on. But it behooved me to figure out why he's overweight. Is he, does he eat because he's depressed? Does he eat because he's anxious? Does he eat because he's obsessed with food? Does he eat because, if I could figure out the reason why he's eating, then no matter what diet I pick, he's gonna be pretty successful. If I don't address that issue, then it's just, you know, he'll go on the diet, lose 10 pounds, and get off the diet. Same thing with ADD. There are different types of ADD, so we can't just keep flipping drugs at these kids. We've got to figure out which of the ADDs they have, and uh, there are different treatments. So, how much time do I have? All night. 
All right. Stress and anxiety. This parallels what I thought this group would like because this parallels to what you guys go through and it parallels what my kids go through because a lot of the kids I have have a lot of anxiety issues. Okay? And this is going to be kind of my approach to anxiety. But you can look at it too. So what is stress? Coined by Hans, Hans Salier in 1936, who defined it as a non-specific response of the body to any demand for change, physical, mental, or emotional strain and tension. It can be good. A little bit of anxiety can help you perform better on a test because you're a little bit more agitated. Uh, he also says a condition or feeling experienced when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources the individual has, and that's going to be a problem. It's too much. Ongoing traumatic stress disorder. We talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. I can tell you my families all wish they had post-traumatic stress disorder. Because that means it's in the past, and whatever it was, it's gone, and I get to deal with it. When you have a child with autism, it's an everyday thing. And when you're living with chronic illness, it's an everyday thing. And that's why yoga was helpful. And he said, you said there's a safe and sane yoga practice being. Does that mean there's an unsafe and insane yoga practice that's being offered as well? I thought that was kind of safe and sane yoga. Yoga's great for our kids. Some of them can do it, too. Um, ongoing traumatic stress disorder, finding oneself in a difficult situation that extends beyond three months, a situation that consume all stabilizing factors and resources that one has to cope, that means you're getting at the end of your rope, uh, can occasionally exceed one's ability to, to cope, and then you get depression, changes of activities of daily living, sleep, exercise, I can't eat, I'm eating too much, I can't sleep, I'm sleeping too much, things change when you're stressed. It's poorly recognized and almost never addressed by the medical community. Well, what does it do physiologically? Um, it results in increased productivity up to a point, and then all of a sudden things break down. That point or break differs for each of us. So if I have a child who's given to me who's dying, I'll be singing a Beach Boy song, because that's what stabilizes me. I have no problem putting in the airway, starting the lines, and singing a Beach Boy song. And that's just what gives me my rhythm and my timing. For other people, they can't do that. If the stress is too great, they just start, they, they freeze. Okay, so we all have different areas of what we can do when put in a stressful situation. I guess if you say that I'm singing a Beach Boy song, I'm getting pretty stressed. That's what keeps me on an even keel. Think of a roller coaster. Basically, it's both external, the stress, and the internal, how you respond to stress. We'll talk about that in a bit. Stresses add up. It's a lifetime thing. Surgeries, infections, injuries, having a special needs children, divorces, work issues, financial issues, this all adds up and it all gets weighed in on those little adrenal glands. Constant stress will eventually have a negative impact on the adrenal glands and they all add up over time. Now where are the adrenal glands? You have one sitting on top of each kidney and they're about the size of a walnut and they do lots of things. They, they, have over, they make almost a hundred different hormones. The adrenal glands are known to make adrenaline, that's the fight or flight hormone, but they also make cortisol and they also make, for women, testosterone, for example. They do a lot of things. Um, they are responsible for resilience, energy, and endurance, which a lot of us at our age can start having problems with. And they have a lot to do with the way you think and feel. So you have to get the thyroid balanced and you have to get the adrenals balanced. Utilization of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins for energy. That's what the adrenal gland does. Cardiovascular function, gut function. Um, they, they decrease or mitigate um, your allergic responses to the world. Remember I told you a lot of our kids are very uber allergic. Well, that's because of the fact that they're chronically stressed themselves and they're becoming more and more allergic. Uh, they're responsible for repairing, healing, and control of inflammation. There's that inflammation word again. In 1932 were the, some of the first articles on cortisol saying you can't heal from surgery if you have no cortisol, if your adrenal glands aren't working properly. So they knew back in the 30s that cortisol was very important for healing. So if you're trying to heal from a, an event, you know, have to have your cortisol checked and make sure it's okay. Um, they also make the sex hormones and, and they're responsible for salt balance. Over time, the adrenal gland can be fatigued. Now there's two thoughts on that. One is that the gland is actually becoming fatigued, and the other thought is the brain is not stimulating the adrenal gland to do what it's supposed to do. So there's two camps there. There's a little bit of 
if they, I like the word, they always like to cloud things, controversy there. But I can tell you that if, you ha if your adrenal gland is fatigued and it's actually a gland, you, it's sore. You can put your finger on it and it's sore. And you can see it on ultrasound. It's not doing well. Every organ will eventually be impacted if this gland does not work properly. So the adrenal gland is really, really important. All right. Lifestyle stress on your body. Poor food choices. No vegetables. Lots of chocolate. Lots of carbohydrates and alcohol. And as we get older, you probably know, not you, but other people drink a lot of alcohol. The older you get, the more alcohol is consumed. Is a, glass of red wine good? a glass of red wine is terrific, especially if it's a nice Cabernet. Okay. <laughs> Staying up late at nights, especially if you have a special needs kid at home. Cabernet is really good. Maybe two. Uh, staying up late at nights, um, surfing the web. A lot of my younger moms are staying up till 2 or 3 in the morning because they are going to find the cure for autism and they're going to search everything. It is on their shoulders to fix their child and they become hypervigilant. And they are also doing Facebook and they are also blogging. And they're getting a lot of this blue screen time which is really screwing up melatonin for sleep and screwing up their adrenal glands. Okay, and because of not feeling well for one reason or another, we don't exercise and we forget about, um, what's that? Enjoyable activities, okay. Symptoms of adrenal fatigue, here we go. Difficulty getting up in the morning, okay. I have some kids who can't get up. I have kids who can get up too early, like three in the morning. Not feeling refreshed after a night's sleep. I sleep great, but I still can't get going. Craving salt. Difficulty getting through the day. Everything's a chore. Easily aggravated. Boy, are my kids easily aggravated. Boy, was my mom easily aggravated. I thought it was just being mom. Lightheaded when standing up quickly. Those are all signs that your adrenal gland isn't working well. Frequent illnesses take a lot more time to get over. Depression, decreased enjoyment. Thoughts are more fog foggy, unfocused, and memory loss. Adrenal gland. Not Alzheimer's. Adrenal gland. Don't misdiagnose this. Don't forget this little guy. Um, do you have adrenal fatigue? I threw this in. Go to adrenalfatigue.org and you can take a little test and see if your adrenal gland is acting up. Your answers will be calculated to determine the potential for adrenal fatigue. It's just a nice area to go to to see if you've got something to arm yourself with. Uh, I test it with saliva. I take four tests a day. The, the spit also re reflects what's going on in the adrenal gland. Um, you can also look at testosterone levels. As us guys get older, our testosterone levels drop. Good luck with that. We need to have testosterone replacement. Um, your blood pressure will go up when your testosterone drops. Your blood sugars will go up. You'll be called pre-diabetic. And the medical community has all kinds of things to treat your high blood pressure and your high cholesterol. And they'll treat you with all this stuff when all you need is some testosterone. Um, also need a complete thyroid panel. Metabolic profile, complete blood count at the very least with strong consideration for evaluation of nutritional profile and IgG food allergy panel. Because if you don't test the foods and you're eating the wrong foods, it's going to cream your system. Techniques of stress reduction. There are numerous good techniques. You have to find the one that works for you. I hate breathing exercises. It kills me. That <laughs> I find that very obnoxious. I've tried it. I can't do that. But other people do that great. They master that. Okay, yoga, reading, exercise, sleep, um, asking for help. We tend to be very independent. Do you want to ask a question without a microphone? Okay. Uh, going back to last night, what, what was the uh, nutritional panel? What was, what, is a nutritional profile, what, what is that? A nutritional panel is, is, that's a good question. You asked, what is the nutritional profile? Um, there are some labs that will look at all your vitamins and all your minerals. And they run around $400. Insurance usually is glad not to pay for that for you. And um, you can get it like at lef.org. Yeah. Okay, Life Extension, lef.org. They've got some great panels. Um, but I always like to see how is our iron level? How is our, you know, it goes through the whole thing. And then I can say, you know, you need more B12. Okay. okay. Uh, so yes, sir. How do you take the supplementary test off? How do I take it? So, yeah, a couple slides. Okay, at first I have to. Pressure. Okay, so first I want to measure your testosterone, okay? And we measure your testosterone and it's low. Well, my problem is they say, well, for a 60-year-old, that looks pretty good. Well, I don't want the testosterone of a group of 60-year-olds, whoever they found on the street and said, this is what normal 60-year-olds have. 
I want the testosterone of a, I don't want a 20-year-old ever again. 30-year-old, okay? 30-year-old. Okay, 20 is good maybe, but not for me. 30. And, and then you say, okay, then you start taking testosterone. Now, how do you take testosterone? He asked. Um, there, there is compounded testosterone. You get it from a compounding pharmacy. A doctor has to write for this. You can't get this on your own. And my experience is those, those, those herbs and plants that promise to raise your testosterone, they don't. Okay, you want, if you're low on testosterone, don't dink around because there's too much at stake. Your cholesterol's going up, your blood pressure's going up, your memory's going away. Take the friggin' testosterone, okay? And figure out what your dose is for you. And working with a doctor, you can find out the perfect dose. Too much is not good, too little is not good, just right. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. See what I had to learn? Because in my group of patients right now, I've got six, seven, eight-year-olds who have way too much testosterone. I didn't put this in here. Way too much testosterone. It's driving them to rage. It's driving them mad. They've got some weird, funky sexual preoccupations. It's a disaster. I have to lower their testosterone. Okay. I can use Lupron, yeah. Luprolide, actually. Yeah. And I can use some natural things too, but it doesn't seem to work. It works for my polycystic ovary syndrome patients who make too much testosterone for, for females. I can get away with using the more natural things to lower testosterone, but I can't do that with, with boys. Are they also then estrogen low results? No, actually a lot of it gets shunted over to make estrogen. So what I do is I test males should not have high levels of estrogen because it's all being fed over there and it's raising up estrogen levels. So how are they, I was thinking of it, the pathways. Yeah, the pathways, yeah, because these, these, these are the sex hormones. And if you've got a lot of DHEA and DHES and it's going to be making testosterone, testosterone can then go off and make estrogens. So it's not blocked? It's not blocked. Yeah. Or it's not. Okay, so I have, I have, I, w I wish I can go through and show you. I mean, this last week I had a really high estrogen level. I'm going, man, this guy's going to build up real quick if we don't fix that. But they're mean kids. They'll bite, they'll pinch, they'll hit, they'll headbutt. They're mean. That's not autism. The kid's got too much testosterone. Fix that. And the kid's much milder, gentler. And you're not doing anything bad. OK. Biomedical interventions, the adrenal gland and food. Break the addictive cycle of, there it is again. Darn, I can't get away from that. Sugar and white flour products. Whole grains are best. Yes, but no. Because the fact they keep changing our grains, I just say go off the grains. Gluten-free diet. If you test positive gluten sensitivity, I don't think anybody should be eating gluten. And if you do it early, before you have a real problem with it, then you can have it once in a while. But, but uh, if you have issues, you probably get rid of it. Limit fruits. OK to salt your food to taste. Don't look at the last line. <laughs> Avoid chocolate if there's significant. Now, this is if you have adrenal fatigue. And this is how we resuscitate that wee little adrenal gland so you can eat chocolate one day. But try magnesium. A lot of people crave chocolate, not because it's wonderful, but there's something in it they really want. It's magnesium. Okay, in bed before 10.30, you sleep in 10 to 15 minutes. Like I told you, melatonin, a half a milligram, a milligram 30 minutes before sleep. If more support is needed, you can add the 5-HTP. Calcium citrate, if still not asleep, adrenal extracts. And if still not able to sleep, one to four tablets of uh, hypothalamus extract with 10 to 40 milligrams of manganese. That's what I will use if we're having for adults. And a lot of my parents, the reason I know this is because I got a lot of parents who just, I get the kids sleeping through the whole night and the mom still can't because she's used to the kid waking up and her whole brain and body is wired for waking up in the middle of the night. Um, vitamin C is probably the most important. 80% of vitamin C goes to the adrenal gland. Okay, so a lot of us don't get enough vitamin C. There, you know, everybody says, this is the vitamin C that you need. From this research I found, it's about two to one bioflavonoids. So if you have 500 milligrams of vitamin C, you need to have to have 250 milligrams of bioflavonoids. People keep tweaking that so they can say, my vitamin C is the best, and they want to sell it to you, a little more, a little less, whatever. Okay, the body will figure it out. Uh, vitamin E. Uh, is indirectly required so, it can, um, so that it can absorb and neutralize free radicals generated by the production of adrenal hormones. Uh, vitamin E in the mix to cough roll is best, uh, but it may cause blood thinning and make you prone to bleed if you're already on a blood thinner. Coumadin clinic. Anybody know of anybody on Coumadin clinic? Why would you use rat poison to thin blood? You can do it with vitamin E. You can do it with uh, high dose omega oils. 
If I take too much omega oils, when I blow my nose, there's some blood, I can thin my blood down, okay? You don't want it too thin, obviously, because then you can have problems with bleeding. But there is a way to make your blood thinner more naturally that doesn't involve the word poison in there. Um, panathenic acid is very important in the production. And when combined with magnesium, vitamin E, and C, it takes much of the fatigue out of the adrenals with, without overstimulating them. Dosing is usually 500 milligrams three times a day. Niacin, and this is on my website, Mending Autism. If you guys ever want to see these slides again, you can go to Mending Autism. Um, it's free, okay, mendingautism.com. Just hit um, adrenal stress. Uh, but niacin is very important, but if you get the wrong one, you'll have your own personal summer. Your face will turn bright red. So I use flesh-free niacin. It's a very obnoxious feeling. Women would know that. I wouldn't. Okay. B6, very important. I use P5P. That's the activated form of B6. So again, what I'm saying is that you can have a problem and we can make it better and you'll feel better. And this is what I do with the kids. B complex, so important for these kids. Natural forms of B complex may have less of these milligrams, but because they're natural, you don't need as much. Magnesium, citrate, I use a lot of that in my practice. Great for the nervous system and calming. Calcium has, seems to have a calming effect throughout the nervous system. Adults typically need 750 to 1,000 milligrams, but if you're prone to stones, not the rolling stones, <laughs> calcium oxalate crystals, got to watch this carefully. I don't have kids like that. Phosphatidylserine can lower elevated cortisol. Some of the families have too high of cortisol levels, and we have to lower it. Um, it's best to get a cortisol level to know what you're doing. Trace minerals are chromium, copper, iodine, manganese, molly B, and selenium and zinc. Small amounts are needed daily. Uh, some people drink seawater. They actually have bottled seawater that, that has the minerals in it. Uh, whatever, you need them. Fiber, there's that fiber again, very important, because you can't be constipated with adrenal glands that aren't working well. Um, the five best herbs for dealing with adrenal gland, licorice root. No, this is not licorice, okay? Licorice root, ashwagandha. I use a lot of ashwagandha in my practice. Um, Siberian ginseng, ginger root, ginkgo leaf. There's a lot about each one of these. I don't want to go through each one, but if you go to my website, you can read about each one of these since you guys tend to want to look at stuff. Um, but there's a lot of uh, literature written on the works of literature of ashwagandha, licorice root. I use, I think ashwagandha is great, especially um, the Cartzenel boys tend to marry high-strung women, and they tend to have anxiety. Um, John, uh, his new wife, Hannah, is in her second year of veterinary medicine school, and she crashed this year with anxiety. And um, we were able to shut that down. David's wife, the same thing. So we've got to be very careful with, um, with anxiety and all with our kids. Uh, adrenal glands, if you're in ginseng root, and ginger, I like ginger, ginger's good, ginkgo biloba, everybody's heard about that, especially with Alzheimer's and how it's supposed to um, get more blood flow to the brain. Then the extracts, if we have to get there, um, action is support and fortify and restore normal adrenal function. Again, unfortunately, you're going to need a lot of physician work and input on this if you're going to do it right, if you're really just suffering from anxiety and fatigue. So bottom line is what I wanted to bring to you tonight was to show you what's happening in the other end of the spectrum, in the children's spectrum. Um, in many ways, they're just as messed up as, as some of uh, our older patients. Uh, there's different underlying metabolic sources that result in loss of focus and concentration. Um, special care is needed to pull things out from the diet that can disconnect the brain. Supplements can be added to specifically address either dietary deficiencies and or metabolic or genetic deficiencies. And that's what we're trying to do with our adults as well. Medications are not all evil. Sometimes they are required. So what you have to do is prioritize what needs to be done. What everybody can do here is work on the diet, okay? Sleep, treatment of the bowel issues. That's always a great place to start. Uh, maximize nutrition. And then we target specific issues like we talked about, allergies, inflammation, chronic infections, focus, concentration, language development. And that's enough stuff for you guys. Now, question and answers. With the mic.
do you test for oxalates and when they're elevated other than dietary restriction? Are there other tools that you have for addressing the oxalate issue? Okay, so now we're getting really specific. Some people have been reading. One of the things in diets that can mess up children, are, well, there's a few things. We talked about gluten and dairy, and then there's salicylates and oxalates and all. And yes, I can test for them, test for them in the urine organic acid test and see if the oxalate levels are high. There can be a false positive if they're taking vitamin C because vitamin C will turn into oxalates on the way to the laboratory. So you've got to make sure they're off vitamin C for a good week. And then if it is high, then I have a list of foods that are high in oxalates, and I go to the foods that are medium and low first to see if that works. Because all foods have oxalates. I mean, it's very hard. But that's where you get into these people saying, well, they need to be on the specific carbohydrate diet. Well, that's a nut diet. It's just everything you take out, all of your all of your grains, potatoes, rice, flours, gluten-free, whatever, all your grains are gone. The specific carbohydrate diet is just your only carbohydrate are nuts. But I say a lot of our kids tend to be on the verge of being hypoallergic and you start dumping in a lot of nuts, they're going to become allergic to nuts. I did that to my son. So nuts are high in oxalates. So if you have, so you have different people saying, oh, they need to be on a specific carbohydrate diet, then the oxalate people say, you can't be on that because that's high in oxalates. So. But yeah. You know, I've had kidney stones for 30 years, and the only thing the doctors ever told me is drink lots of water. They've never told me what not to do, or yeah. what to do. Okay, so when you pass the stone, they can tell you what it's made of. Okay, it well, might I be calcium oxalate. oxalate. I mean, yes. Yeah, but. so you have to go on a low oxalate diet. Okay, you, you take away the building blocks of the stones, and that's why I said, when, when, when I was talking about calcium for adults, let's make sure we don't have stones, because we don't want to build that both in the gallbladder which are usually cholesterol stones, but they can be others. So yeah, that's good. Is it methyl mercury in vaccines that's associated with autism, or is it something else? Yes and yes. Okay. And what's the something else? It doesn't matter. Okay. What I'm saying to you is that when you look at autism, everybody says it's because. It's because thimerosal the mercury in the vaccine. No, it's the measles, part of the MMR. No, it's the aluminum, okay? Or it's the formaldehyde, or it's one of the bazillion components, it's the egg, okay? Whatever the child is sensitive to, we're gonna have a problem. So for one child, it can be the mercury. For the next child, it can be, you guys know that they do put mercury in most of the vaccines, right? Flu shots and stuff. 25 micrograms of mercury are in flu shots, okay? Mercury is the second most toxic substance known to man on planet Earth next to plutonium, okay? Why would they put something like that in a vaccine that's given to anybody? I, I do not know. But for some people, yeah, I think mercury is the problem. For some people, aluminum is the problem. For some people, it's formaldehyde is the problem. For some people, it had nothing to do with the vaccine, okay? So yes to all the questions. But it's not just the one thing. That'd be too easy. Okay, autism is a final common pathway disorder. This might help you. If I had four children coughing, one's coughing because they're having an asthma attack, one's coughing because they got a cold, and one's coughing because they swallowed a toy part, the final common pathway is the cough. But the underlying mechanism, the asthma, the cold, the toy part, they're totally different. And my approach is, is to fix the right problem. You can't treat a swallowed toy part with an asthma drug. Okay. So when I look at autism, it's a final common pathway. It is the end result of something bad going on in the body, maybe triggered in this case by mercury, maybe triggered in this case by the measles, maybe in this case triggered by the DPT shot, or maybe it doesn't have anything to do with vaccines. Did you read Dr. Mary's monkey and uh, polio vaccine? No, I think I missed that one. But the polio vaccine was full of the simian monkey virus that my generation got that makes you more susceptible to leukemia. Prostate cancer. And the government does not want to identify that because of potential of phenomenal amount of lawsuits and what they'd have to divulge. And by the way, uh, Lee Arby Hoswell worked for her. Other questions? Another one? Do you look at nagalase and have you used GCMAF? In You're any getting other? way too complicated for this group. <laughs> <laughs> any thoughts? Why, on why don't we talk about that after? Because okay, yeah. that's that's like, come on, <laughs> nagalase and GCMF. 
you're the doctor. Yeah, but they don't want to hear this. You made a comment at dinner that uh, autism is like, uh, like Alzheimer's, just like a, you can liken it to autism. I mean, to autism. Can you explain that? Or right, at dinner, at dinner time, I said that uh, I consider Alzheimer's adult onset autism. Okay, it's a neuroinflammatory condition. They're losing, they're losing skill sets. They're losing memory. They're losing language. They're becoming aggressive. Um, they're becoming very aggressive. And if you look, they actually start, women start growing whiskers, okay, testosterone, okay. Things are changing in their body. And um, I think it's more of a toxic event. I don't think it's like a program, you're going to get it kind of a thing. I think you can um, try again, like if you specific. I mean, once part of the brain gets amputated, I can't bring it back. But if you can start early on and try and figure out resuscitating the diet, getting anything inflammatory out of the diet. If they've been, like my, my father-in-law, exposed to a lot of heavy metals, you chelate them, okay? I mean, back in the old days, I mean, we used to suck gas out of carburetors when we were cleaning them. I mean, we did a lot of stupid stuff when we worked on our cars, and we were exposed to a lot of things back then, a lot of toxins. And we have to try and detoxify our bodies and work on it. You have to be motivated. It's not easy to do, but yeah, I think, I think like in, in some cases, we can uh, at least halt the progression or reverse it if we address it the right way. Uh, what do you think about metal fillings and talking about heavy metals and exposure in your body? Metal fillings, okay. This is really funny because um, we were coming under tremendous scrutiny uh, working with dentists not to put in amalgams. Those are the, the silver fillings that many of us have or had. And 50% um, of the weight of an amalgam, 50% of the weight of the amalgam is made out of mercury. Okay, so it comes to the dentist in this big red biohazard box. But when he puts it in your mouth, it's okay. If he pulls them out, it has to go back in the big red metal box that says biohazard, okay, and disposed of very costly. So now, dentists don't do them, most dentists. I mean, the, the freebie clinics and stuff like that will still use amalgams, but generally doctors don't do that. Uh, they can cause allergies. Obviously, they can cause this slow wafting of mercury into the body, and very, very toxic. So do you recommend removal? I, re I recommend removal, but you have to do it very carefully by what's called a mercury-free dentist. And very often, they'll chelate you, which is a fancy word of saying removing, like I did with my wife. I gave her oral DMSA to chelate any inadvertent mercury that got in the system during the removal process, but they, they do it low temperature, they have a big water wash, they have this giant vacuum, they put a dam in the back of your throat so you can't swallow it, and it's very costly. Okay, that might be a reason to go to Panama. Yes. <laughs> what, Where did you try care? What is it about uh, uh, dairy that's uh, so, what, attacking your your body, what is it about dairy that comes right. after you? Dairy, dairy's changed over the years. When, when I was a kid, when you guys were kids, um, dairy came from Jersey cows, Jersey made. All us cows do our best for Jersey made if you grew up in California. And then they realized that they can get more milk from a Holstein. Now Holstein's milk is different than a Jersey milk. There's concern about the, uh, the casein levels, okay? And the casein is what, in, for what the kids that I deal with, is turned into morphine, caseomorphine. Okay? And of course, if you could have a milk without casein, then you wouldn't have that, but you can't get a milk without casein. Then there's fragments. Is it A1 casein, A2 casein, a lot of stuff going on with that. But by and large, dairy is just not a good protein for many of the kids that we take care of. Now, how about genetics and demographics? Have you ever gotten cheese on your mushu pork? Asians don't do well with dairy. That's why when they, you go to an Asian restaurant, there's not dairy involved, okay? Um, another group that doesn't do well with dairy would be the African Americans don't do well with dairy, genetically, just pre-programmed. So that's why there's a problem that who gets a little carton of milk on all their lunches? A lot of kids do, a lot of kids do, whether they be black or Asian. You give them dairy, and then you send them off to one o'clock algebra, they're going to be disconnected. It's not good. In the 1980s, a, um, a great doctor, Frank Oski, wrote, don't drink your milk. And he's way ahead of his time. And I think he was the, uh, 
the chairman of pediatrics at, I think it was Harvard, okay? And he wrote, don't drink your milk, okay? And he documents, when they're starving in Africa, what do we send them? Milk. Pallets of dry milk, okay? Thank you. Yeah, milk is for cows. A couple of things. Uh, through some of the reading I've done, and there is the idea that the thimerosal cell is actually quite different from the molecular uh, formula of mercury. And I just wonder what you think about that. Okay, then. so now we're getting into bio biochemistry. And what she's talking about is the difference of ethyl mercury and methyl mercury. And that's right. going to be a little bit beyond the scope of our talk here mm -hmm. because it's a little bit complicated. Uh, as you saw, kind of controversial. I wouldn't want anyone I've injected in my body <laughs> if it's got mercury in it. Uh, how about mercurochrome? Anybody remember mercurochrome? What happened to mercurochrome? It's gone. It's poison. Okay. And where do we put mercurochrome? On raw owies. Open wounds. <coughs> yeah. Pink's disease, they used to put mercury in the gums. Pink's disease back in the 40s, okay, to help with teething. So we have a long history of working with mercury, and it's not good. Now, the next question is, even if it was, even if it was, why is it in the vaccines? Okay, you don't have to put anything in vaccines if you go to single-dose vials. The reason they put any kind of preservative in vaccines is when the doctor goes in and he draws up a shot, that's one out of 10, because they made it a multi-dose vial. Open in, two, pulls it out, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. But if you just open one vial and threw it out and gave it, you don't have to put any, any preservative in there. What they're worried about is if you keep entering that bottle, you may introduce something toxic. So let's just put something in there that in case you do, it's ready, ready there to destroy it. Well, first of all, they found out that any kind of mercury is not a good thing to put into a fluid to keep it from becoming not filled with bacteria. That's, that's number one. Number two, um, you know what they save? 50 cents a dose by doing a multivial thing. I'd rather pay the extra 50 cents and not get it. Okay. And all for, Now the next thing is that these little pieces of mercury are not in solution. They kind of settle at the bottom. So the nurse has to shake it up real good before drawing it up to, to get an equal distribution of the mercury throughout the solution. Did I know that? No. So you draw number one, number two, number three, number four. By the time you get to dose number nine or 10, you're sucking up a lot of mercury in that vaccine. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. The second question is about the removal of amalgams. And so how I actually had quite uh, several removed, but I was never aware, you know, that I needed to go to a, to a mercury-free dentist. And so I'm just wondering, could you say a little bit more about what happens if this was not done by, by a mercury-free dentist? What are they? Yeah, okay, so the question is, well, what if you have them removed and you don't go to a mercury-free dentist? Um, then you risk um, being exposed to a large amount of mercury vapor because they're drilling it and it vaporizes and you're inhaling it, right? Uh, you know, you're breathing and then swallowing it, okay? And that mercury is, and that mercury for sure, there's nothing debatable about that. That's the bad stuff that's in the amalgams. And it's a neurotoxin. So the next question is, well, do we need to chelate you, okay? Um, I, I, you know, in this world, there are natural chelators that you can start thinking about, um, or you can go see a doctor and they can draw levels. The problem is that mercury is quickly, quickly sequestered into fat tissue. So one of the funny studies they came out with is they did a study on neonates, giving them the hepatitis B vaccine that had thimerosal in it. And they gave the shots of thimerosal and then measured their blood for mercury three days later. And they said, you see, there's no mercury in the blood. But what they didn't tell you, as my father-in-law said, well, where'd it go, son? I said, they didn't look where it went. They just said it wasn't in the blood. The blood is a taxi cab. The blood is a taxi cab. 
And if you've ever been in a taxi cab, you know the first thing you want to do is get off and get out of the taxi cab. Mercury, lead, arsenic will ride in the taxi cab and it'll get off as soon as it can into, in Mercury's case, fat. It loves fat. And it loves metabolically active fat. In other words, lots of blood flow going to that area of the body. So you have this baby that's just been born. The brain is really turned on, man. The eyes are open and now we're feeling hunger and the baby is just processing sound, sounds and everything. The brain is really metabolically active. The brain is 70% fat. So where's the mercury going to be driven to, preferentially? The brain. So that's the dangerous part about it. So um, would you recommend liposomal glutathione for removing mercury? And if so, what protocol? You know, the, the thing is, if we're going to do something, in my book, if I'm going to remove something, I have to be able to show you I'm doing it. OK? In other words, I like, for example, when I do chelation with children, I have the parents collect six hours of urine if I have a kid. If I can, I'll just get a random urine because they just put the little bag on the, the privates and grab me some urine and say, this is it. But here's how I do it. I get six hours of urine. Kid wakes up, eight in the morning, pees, and then I say, okay, let's collect all the, the urine the child makes between nine and two, and then send it off to the lab. And the lab will tell me what's coming out in the urine, mercury, lead, arsenic, tin, aluminum, whatever. Then I say, I'm going to chelate the child and chelate him. I don't care what I pick at this point. Let's pick DMSA. I chelate the child. So we start the chelation on Friday. Saturday, the child wakes up, pees in the morning, and I collect the urine from 9 to 2. So here's Saturday without my chelator. Here's Saturday with my chelator. Now I can compare, did I do something? So if I say that I'm chelating your child, I want to show you, because I'm kind of that way. When you hear, the, well, cilantro chelates, how do you know? I kind of want to know. What am I chelating? How do I know what I'm chelating? And how do I know even if it's working? Show me. Oh, you just have to know it's working. Well, I don't buy that. This cleans your liver. Great. Show me a dirty liver. I'll take your product for three months, and then I'll redo the liver test. Oh, it doesn't work that way. Well, how does it work? This cleans your blood. They come out with a lot of these things, and it's like, wow, it's really hard to figure out what we need these days, because everybody's got something they're telling you. I'm kind of a show me kind of person. I'll believe it when I see it. So if you say, now, I do have liposomal glutathione. I'm fine with that. But do I think that's a great chelator on its own? I don't know, because I can't demonstrate it. OK? So if you're asking me, do you know, or does it think it's a good idea? Could it hurt? Nah, it can't hurt. But I don't know if I'm really doing anything. When you think about when we're chelating, uh, it's good to clean the body. I mean, the, the, the fat around the kidneys and stuff, pull the heavy metals. But where do we really want to get it out of? The noggin. And right now, the whole idea of a chelating agent crossing the blood-brain barrier, and this is getting into chemistry now. It's going into a, a hydrophilic environment, and it has to cross into a lipophilic environment. It crosses from a, a watery environment to a fat environment. We don't have anything that does that. We did, but the FDA took it off the market. Okay. Do you know everything? No. Yeah, the answer is OSR. And uh, this was Boyd Haley's product. It was a supplement, but uh, he's kind of uh, verbose against the FDA, so um, they got him back by removing his product. So he's getting it re-licensed through Europe and then eventually be grandfathered in or whatever they call it to get back in the United States. That could actually cross. We don't have anything right now that will cross the blood-brain barrier. And people say, well, what about alpha-lipoic acid? Well, that one is a tough one because if you're a chemist, that has arrows that go both ways. It can pull, but can also push. So I don't use alpha lipoic acid if I think I have a high mercury load or lead load because I'm worried that I may mobilize something that's parked in the kid's big toe and move it into the brain. Okay. So we got to be kind of careful when we're, especially with two and three year olds. I have to be really careful with what I'm doing, and if I don't know what I'm doing, I'm not going to do it. So glutathione's good. I just can't prove it does anything, and I want to show you. Here's your mercury on one, a Saturday, and here it is on another Saturday, and I know we're working. I have a question. Okay. How many people sitting here believe their government tells them the truth? Sometimes. No, not much. Is that right? You know, that you know when they're telling you the truth, Phil? I say sometimes. How do you know when they're telling you the truth? How would you know that? You get it right sometimes. <laughs> The law of averages, they've got to get it right sometime. 
Does DMSA cross the blood-brain barrier? No, there's very, there, there are some um, studies out of Russia, Moscow, that claim that it does in rats, but the rat's blood-brain barrier is really different than the, than the human, so I'm not so sure that it, it does. How do you chelate the brain? You can't right now. Speak but you can chelate yourself. all around it, and they get better. Now, with that said, um, it's, we don't know it all, okay? And I remember I had one kid in, in the state of Washington who was, was just worked up, up, the, up the wazoo through the uh, University of Washington, and uh, we chelated him, and the kid improved tremendously. So I know something fixed the brain. But these, these products are very, very... Um, when you talk about DMSA, it's a great antioxidant. When you talk about DMSA, it is a great source of sulfur. And these kids, some of these kids have a sulfur-wasting disease, and that was demonstrated by Rosemary Waring studies in England. And sometimes we think we're chelating and the kid's getting better, but we're actually doing something different. So bottom line is the kid gets better, I'm, I'm happy. But I, I don't know if we're really getting into the brain with that particular. This is our last event. question. We're going to have a 10-minute break after this question. Can you comment briefly in your patient population how much of an issue mold from indoor water damage and or electromagnetic fields is in your opinion? Mold is a huge issue. My son was so sensitive to mold, man. It was, it was awful. And um, he would, we went to the allergist, uh, you know, really great guy. He was 80 years old when we went to him. He's spectacular. He's still practicing too in New York. And um, he did what was called provocation neutralization desensitization. So they have 10 vials of mold. Vial number one, concentrated. Vial number two, one-tenth of its concentration. Vial number three, one one-hundredth. It's logarithmic, got it? One one thousand, one ten thousand, one hundred thousand, one million, one ten million. One. He went to vial ten, and every time he injected a little bit in, he had to actually go to twelve vials. He had to dilute it twelve times. Once you get to that dose, the, then it doesn't react anymore, and then the dose underneath it causes all of them to go away. Provocation, you provoke a reaction. Neutralization, no reaction. Desensitization makes it go away. Then he puts it in a spray. Okay, mold is a huge issue, and our kids are very, very allergic to mold. We have gotten more allergic like the water, usually around the lights and stuff. So our houses were just laden with, with a mold, but it didn't bother us because we weren't allergic to it. We're becoming more and more allergic. So mold is a huge issue. EMFs, um, electromagnetic, uh, you know, it, it's huge of a problem. I had one kid, it was this week, um, dad figured it out. When he switches off the Wi-Fi, the kid slept through the night. When he leaves the Wi-Fi on, the kid wakes up during the night. But we're being bombarded by Wi-Fi everywhere. I mean, even if I turn off in my house, if I look on my phone, they got three neighbors, you know, with it on too. It's hard to get rid of. But um, I have another family who was very sensitive to it, and she had an electrician come in and put a, like a master switch in each room and turn it off. If they coil the wires, it creates a, a, an electronic magnetic field. Okay. And it's, it's bad, so yeah, I think it's, there's so many issues, what do you do? Let's thank the doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.